looks good. Awesome. Okay. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited. What I'm going to be mostly talking about is dissertation research that I'm still finishing up and um, some of the things that I kind of hope to move forward from this. Uh, so happy to answer any questions and also talk about potential next steps. So I always like to start out with a little bit of a lighthearted ocean acidification and warming introduction with comics because they're um, pretty upsetting topics, but um, science can still make you smile. So ocean acidification are two of the primary stressors impacting uh, oceans, but especially coral reefs. Um, these are the two that my focus has predominantly focused on. So um, I'll go a little bit more in depth into these. So first off, there's ocean warming, um, which here's a map of the increase in sea surface temperature from 1981 to 2019 uh, across the Caribbean. Again, my research is all pretty focused into the Caribbean. So um, I have a very narrow lens into that region. But you can see that we're having pretty high rates of warming across the Caribbean since the 80s. Um, however, those rates are kind of variable based on where you're looking. So you can see even in areas up along the Florida Key, or along the Florida coast, you can see that it's actually not warming as much as places like the Gulf of Mexico. And it's just pretty variable across the Caribbean. Uh, similarly, you have ocean acidification, which is carbon dioxide being dissolved into the ocean, which is resulting in reduced seawater pH. So here's uh, some data from the Manaloa station in Hawaii. And this red line is the atmospheric CO2 measured there. And the green one below it is the seawater pCO2. Um, and then below that is the blue, which shows the reduced seawater pH. Um, I'm predominantly going to be talking about things in the terms of increasing pCO2 rather than decreasing pH. Um, but just remember that they have that inverse relationship. So these two stressors are particularly of interest for Caribbean corals and corals across the globe um, because we're not 100% confident we understand how it's impacting these organisms because they are complex. So here I've got an image of the coral holobiont I've labeled. Um, I know this is not the most charismatic of corals, but this is the one that a lot of our research um, in my PhD was focused on. This is Sideraster sideria. Uh, so this is the animal host component of our coral holobiont. Uh, it's made up of thousands of colonial polyps. And so each of these little black dots along the coral colony would be an individual polyp. Um, makes these organisms really great for experimental studies. You can divide them up and put them into different treatments and you have a single genotype experiencing multiple conditions. So you can kind of cut out a little bit more of that variation across different colonies. So another important component of the holobiont are the algal endosymbionts, which are dinoflagellate algae. And these are the two main components I'm going to talk about. There is also a lot going on in the microbiome. However, I have not done any research personally. So I'm gonna focus on the symbionts and the animal host. Uh, so they have a really important relationship with each other. The coral host provides uh, protection and kind of like a climate control for the symbionts where they're able to modify the symbiosome, the space where the cells are living in the coral tissue. And in return, the symbionts provide uh, can provide up to 100% of metabolic needs to the coral. So they're doing that through things like sugars. Uh, so this is a really important relationship that needs to be maintained for maintenance of coral reefs. However, as I'm sure most of you are aware, it is not a stable relationship. So here I have a cartoon of a healthy coral. If this one you can imagine again is Sideraestria. It's nice and pink. And here I've zoomed in and these are a picture of what the symbionts would look like in the coral tissue. So it's got a lot of symbionts, nice healthy color. Um, however, 
under times of stress, corals go through things referred to uh, as coral bleaching. And so here, the same coral, uh, a lot paler, and if you look at the symbionts, reduced density of the symbionts, if any. And this is a stress response that's mostly associated with warming. However, it can be a stress response for other environmental stressors. And if you notice, I have this double-sided arrow and that's because once a he healthy coral bleaches, it's not necessarily the end of the line for the coral. Often the coral will die. However, if a stress event is short or not severe, the corals are, may be able to recover their symbionts to an apparently healthy state. However, as I mentioned, more often than not, the corals will often die because they're no longer getting those necessary nutrients from their symbionts. And that leads us to here, here's my dead coral. Um, I've covered it in a turfing algae because I wanted to highlight that once a coral dies, the skeleton is exposed. It's no longer, it no longer has that tissue protecting the skeleton to keep it from dissolving and or to keep it from being overgrown by other organisms. Competition for space on reefs is really high. So here we've got algae growing over that coral skeleton and algae can actually facilitate the dissolution and the breakdown of the coral skeleton. So not only when corals die, are you losing the actual coral organisms from the reef, but you're going from these larger colonies and into smaller ones. And for corals that do more of a branching morphology, that might mean breaking them down and, and this impacts our 3D complexity on the reef. So a little bit about how, because um, that previous slide is a little bit more closely tied with warming, uh, I wanted to go in a little bit into how the holobiont is being impacted by acidification. Uh, so here again, I've got an image of a coral polyp and then this diagram that just kind of shows you what a, if you cut into a coral polyp, it would look like. Um, one of my previous advisors described it as a balloon and I always liked that because there's essentially, you have a mouth surrounded by the tentacles, which you can see the tentacles around here. And this is the mouth. And inside it's the gastrovascular cavity, essentially the coral stomach. And then below this blue line, you see the skeleton. So the tissue sits on top of the skeleton. And so this is um, just the only things standing between seawater and the skeleton is the coral tissue. However, we know that corals are able to modify their internal chemistry, which is how they're able to calcify and produce their skeleton. And this process is what is being impacted. Um, there, this is one of the processes that's being impacted by ocean acidification. So here again, we have CO2 coming into seawater, reacting with the water, and then breaking down into a proton and bicarbonate. And here, this is a, just a weirdly drawn coral polyp but it is showing that the corals are utilizing these bicarbonate ions, removing another proton or this H plus and trying to uh, combine the calcium and the carbonate to produce its calcium carbonate skeleton. But it, in order to do this, it's going to be ne needing to remove these protons from within this, um, this small fluid area. Uh, the, um, the uh, subcalicodermal site, as you can see over here. Um, and if you have more protons in the seawater from ocean acidification, it may make this proton pumping process more energetically costly for the corals. And therefore, this is one of the processes that we're concerned that as chemistry is changing, it's impacting our organisms on these really fine scales. But on a larger scale, you know, if one coral's struggling to calcify because of ocean acidification or it's bleaching because of warming, that's not that big of a deal. However, I wanted to get a better sense of how corals were responding in the Caribbean to acidification and warming stressors. Uh, so we conducted a meta-analysis looking at all studies that we could find at the time that had looked at either stressor um, either acidification, warming, their combination, or some, uh, some combination of those. 
And we found these, I think, 11 studies. So it's actually a pretty understudied question in the Caribbean. And here you can see the spread isn't that great, but we have pretty high representation of studies being conducted on corals from the Florida Keys. And again, studies being collected in Belize. So we wanted to look at how these stressors impacted calcification rates. And so we used this meta-analysis to estimate the effects these stressors had. And so really briefly uh, along this y-axis, we had the mean effect size in standard mean difference. And along the x-axis, we had the different treatments. So acidification, warming, and then the combination of stressors. This dotted black line represents zero. So theoretically a line above that, it's a positive effect um, or points above that are a positive effect. Points below that are negative effects. These gray circles are the individual studies that are corrected for sample size uh, or effect size for the size of the actual point. And then these black bars are the 95% confidence intervals and mean based on these studies. So overall, we found that acidification, while it did have a slightly negative effect, it was not significantly negative um, across these studies. However, with warming, we did see that with warmer temperatures, calcification across the Caribbean was significantly reduced. And then looking at the combination, this one isn't as simple as above the line, it's positive, below it's negative, um, but this actually tells us the effect that the combination has. So because our combination value crosses that zero line, uh, we see that the effects of acidification and warming are additive rather than synergistic. So this is suggesting that whatever change you calculate for warming uh, if you and the change you calculate for acidification, if you add those together, that's your result in that combination treatment. So that's what this is telling us here. Um, so we wanted to explore this a little bit further by region. Uh, we knew that Belize and Florida had the highest representation in these studies, and we knew that they had very different environmental conditions they were experiencing. If you think back to the map I showed with warming, um, the temperature changes between the two regions were even variable. So here we looked at, on the left, um, calcification rate per sample per within the studies uh, against aragonite saturation state. Uh, essentially, the lower the saturation state, the lower the pH and vice versa for high pH, high saturation state. And again, y-axis is calcification rate. These nice brown are the Florida Keys and blue is Belize. And you can see that while they overall have a similar response to saturation state, um, calcification rates overall were higher in the Florida corals. And this was similar for warming between Belize and Florida, but this time we're actually seeing a nice um, thermal performance curve, uh, parabolic response to warming where lower temperatures were similar to higher temperatures and there is going to be some happy medium um, somewhere up here where calcification rates are greatest. So this just highlighted the variation within regions. And uh, this was something that helped me to define a little bit more about looking specifically within the Belize region for corals. So I collected corals from two sites in Southern Belize, uh, which as you can see here, it's just South of Mexico. And we had a nearshore site, the Port Honduras Marine Reserve and an offshore site, the Sabadella Keys Marine Reserve. And we collected these four species from both sites. Um, don't worry, I'm gonna tell you the names, but I also will always have photos of them. So the first one is Sideraster Sideria. This is the massive starlet coral. Some people call it big red because they can get really big. Um, they also have been referred to as the cockroach of the oceans because they are everywhere and they're pretty resilient. Um, the symmetrical brain coral, Pseudodiploria strigosa, Parides astroides, the mustard hill coral, and then my personal favorite is Undaria tenuifolia, the lettuce leaf coral. So we collected all four of these from both sites. Um, just for those of you who don't do coral research, this is actually an image of us shipping 10 moving boxes full of live corals from southern Belize up to Northeastern's marine lab out at Nahant. 
Um, so this picture of the bunker, if you haven't ever been out there, highly recommend checking it out. Um, so I conducted the actual experiment at Northeastern. So um, we brought the corals up and then it was time to set up the experimental treatments. So first in blue, we had 28 degrees, which is a typical summer average for these corals. And then in orange, we had 31 degrees Celsius, which is a projected, moderate projected summer temperature for these corals. Within each temperature, we had four PCO2 treatments. So from left to right, we had the pre-industrial, which was an approximate pre-industrial uh, PCO2 level that these corals may have experienced. We had a current day of about 400 parts per million. A moderate end of century uh, projection for these. And then we really wanted to push the corals to the physiological limits. So we had an extreme PCO2 treatment. Um, I haven't put the pHs up here, but essentially the pH of this extreme treatment was about 7.2 and the current one was about 8.1. So it was a very extreme condition to put the corals in. So we took each of our coral colonies, as I mentioned, they're really great because you can actually section them up and put them into all of your experimental treatments. So we did just that. We sectioned each coral into eight fragments, put it into one of the eight treatments that we were looking at. We did this for all of them. So we had eight fragments per colony, 12 colonies per species, and four species uh, totaling 384 coral fragments in the experiment. So just a quick overview of the timeline. Uh, so after we sectioned the corals, we did allow them 23 days under ambient temperature and PCO2 um, and light for a recovery period. Following that recovery period, we slowly adjusted all the experimental conditions over 20 days. So adjusting temperature and PCO2 very slowly as to not shock the corals. Followed by a 30 day acclimation period where the corals were at treatment, but they were allowed to acclimate to these treatments. And then a 93 day experimental period. And so, at several time points throughout the experiment, including at the start of the acclimation period, end of the acclimation period, and every 30 days throughout the experiment, we buoyantly weighed the corals. Um, here's our buoyant weighing system over here. Uh, so we dangled the corals underneath the scale in some seawater to be able, be able to measure the skeletal growth without taking into consideration any of the tissue or um, eliminating issues caused by corals retaining water. Additionally, we had two time points where we were able to assess the physiological um, assay or do physiological assays on the coral samples. Uh, we pulled a fragment per colony at the start of the experimental period. These corals were maintained under ambient conditions, as well as we flash froze all the corals at the end of the experiment where we were able to do um, the full suite of physiological assays after they had been in experiments. So again, quick overview of the sample processing. Here we have our little coral fragment on a Petri dish, just like they were in the experiments. First thing we did was we pulled a micro sample from each fragment for gene expression down the line. Um, I actually did that at Boston University before I was a postdoc. Next, we airbrushed the tissue off as to not damage the skeleton. So we removed all the tissue from each fragment. I wanted to preserve the skeletons because I wanted to look into the corallite physiology or morphology. Uh, so here is an example of what a corallite might look like. Then we took that tissue that we removed, we homogenized it. Then we pulled an aliquot for symbiont density. So here you can see some symbiont cells. We then pelleted down our symbiont cells to measure the chlorophyll content of each sample. So here you can even just visualize this was probably more of a bleached coral, whereas this one probably had higher symbiont density and um, chlorophyll content. Next, we then took the remaining tish host tissue slurry and we used that for energy reserves. We measured the total protein, lipid, and carbohydrates from all of our samples. And so the goal was to try and get an overview of what was happening to these corals. 
So if you've never been on a Caribbean coral reef, this might be misleading. If you have, this might be upsetting, but this is what I want you to think of for a Caribbean coral reef for the remainder of this talk. Um, this just happens to be made up of the four species I'm also studying. So just keep an eye on it um, because I'm gonna bring it back up later. And before I get too far into things, I wanted to give a really big shout out to these four amazing students who worked with me various amounts of time, but uh, they were really helpful in everything. And I'm really thankful to have gotten to work with them. So first off, we wanted to look at the calcification rates, which this is the bulk growth of the skeleton. We measured this through buoyant weights. And again, bulk growth, overall growth of the entire fragment. And I'm going to orient you really quickly to the figures. So along the y-axis, we have calcification rates. And on the x-axis, I'm doing it in PCO2. But just to remind you, low PCO2 corresponds to a high seawater pH, low seawater pH, high PCO2. Um, this gray dotted line is the zero point. So any points that fall above that dotted line is positive growth. Any that fall below are negative growth. And the blue bars or the blue data is 28 degrees. Orange red is 31 degrees. The actual points are the raw values, the raw rates, and the bars are the modeled 95% confidence intervals. So all of the calcification data will look like this. And again, photos right by it. Uh, so here are the calcification rates for all four of those species. Uh, rather than bore you with intricate details, I wanted to really just show you these overall patterns. So I mentioned Sideroastria is known to be kind of a cockroach of corals, and you can kind of see that reflected in how it responded to treatment. Even at that really high PCO2, where we would actually kind of expect the corals to be actively dissolving just based on the chemistry of the seawater and the makeup of the skeleton, we're seeing that they were able to maintain positive growth. Um, and there was not much of an effect of, uh, not much of a measurable effect of temperature on calcification rates. However, for Pseudoplurius strigosa, we see a clear decline in calcification rates with warming. Um, and less of an effect with PCO2, uh, suggesting that these corals are going to be severely affected in terms of growth uh, under warming. Then for Parides astroides, we see that again, not much of an effect of temperature and really only that significant decline in calcification rates at that high PCO2, but that's not unexpected. And if you see that tenufolia is mostly covered by the skull and crossbone, that's because Turns out these corals do not like to be maintained in experimental systems where you modify their conditions. Uh, we had 100% survival success in our control treatment. However, um, as soon as the corals were started to be put under warming stress, we noticed uh, fragments rapidly dying. And so while we can't do too much to assess them about their physiological response, we can say from the survival data, that these corals are not thrilled to be in high PCO2 or high temperature conditions. This also means that moving forward, I'm not able to talk about them. So at, at, even though they're my favorite ones, um, this is the last I'll talk about them. So in addition to calcification rate, which it was again that bulk growth, we looked at the linear extension. Um, I love including this photo because it's just a really bright color. Uh, we put calcine dye into all of the experimental tanks uh, for about a week at the start of the experiment to Im implant this bright green line into the skeleton so we can measure the skeletal growth above the start, above that line for the start of the experiment. So here, again, upward growth. Um, and this method really only worked for two of our species, Sideroastria and Parides. Uh, because the other ones weren't taking it into their skeleton reliably. Um, so we focused on these two corals. And again, these overall trends show that PCO2 wasn't having a significant effect on the extension rates, um, maybe more so in parietes. And again, temperature wasn't really impacting it. But the interesting thing is 
Um, this is showing that no matter what the treatment was, these corals were producing that positive linear extension. They were growing up. Um, even though some of the calcification data suggests that we were seeing reduced calcification rates. Um, so that's suggesting that the corals are losing their skeleton in other ways rather than um, they're having reduced upward growth. Maybe it's the density of the skeleton. Uh, I personally think it's a lot to do with dissolution, uh, which I was lucky enough to get to uh, take some SEM images of these corals. Again, here is a coralite, and I zoomed in specifically on these septal ridges. Oops. And so here you can see a septal ridge. Um, and then on those ridges, I was able to look specifically at each peak. And so here are two examples of peaks I observed that had clear dissolution, where you can see the different layers of the calcium carbon or the aragonite calcium carbonate um, flaking away. Um, in that high PCO2, high temperature treatment. So this is something I'm exploring a little bit more, um, but this is one of the things I think that's going on. Uh, so moving on from just calcification, I wanted to go over some of the holobiont physiology we have measured. Um, again, just orient you quickly to the figure. Here, the y-axis is the total host energy reserve which is the sum of proteins, lipids, and carbs per sample. Um, and again, blue is 28, orange is 31. And um, over here, you can see there's either a T0 or T90, and that's just the comparison. These green ones are the samples that we pulled from each colony at the start of the experiment versus the experimental ones that had been in the treatments for 90 days. And again, this is Sidorastria. So here is all of the physiology or the host physiology data for all three species. For Sidorastria, you see that again, PCO2 has a moderate effect reducing the physiology. And we start to see evidence that temperature is reducing the physiology, the host physiology in the species, but um, it wasn't a clear difference, suggesting that maybe if these corals were put in the system longer or under a more extreme thermal stress, maybe we would see that um, temperature was reducing the physiology. However, for uh, Pseudodiploria, we again see this clear difference between 28 degrees and 31 degrees, um, again, highlighting that this is a pretty thermally sensitive species. And then for parietes, we see not much of an effect of temperature. Um, however, um, we start to see reduced physiology with increasing PCO2. As far as the symbiont physiology goes here, on the top we have chlorophyll A content, which we were using as a proxy for the, um, the photosynthetic efficiency of the symbionts. And then at the bottom is cell density, so how many symbionts were present. Um, and again, looking at Sidorastria, we see that this time there's not a clear effect of temperature, but we do see that as PCO2 is increasing, we're seeing fewer symbionts and those symbionts are, uh, contain less chlorophyll, suggesting that these corals are gonna have fewer symbionts and it's not like they're being replaced by more efficient ones with more chlorophyll content. Looking at Pseudodiploria, again, the story is pretty clear reduced chlorophyll content, reduced cell density with warming, um, not as clear with PCO2, um, but we see that this is a thermally sensitive species that is losing its symbionts, which is probably why we're seeing uh, reduced host uh, physiology and calcification rates. And then finally, we have the chlorophyll content uh, declining rapidly with increasing PCO2, but we might actually have slightly higher chlorophyll content at 31 than at 28. And that's not entirely surprising for this species because they're known to host symbionts that are thought to be more thermally tolerant. Um, and again, symbiont density, not as much going on for this species. Uh, so parietes seems to be uh, pretty resistant in their symbiont physiology. So then I wanted to kind of combine everything together in these PCAs um, for the three different species. Uh, so here for Sidorastria, 
uh, you have the different physiology components of the each fragment. Um, the colors in this one are represented by PCO2. So the light purple is pre-industrial, dark purple is current day, light orange is that moderate end of century, and the dark orange is extreme. And it, this kind of makes sense. You can see that the corals in the lower PCO2 treatments tended to have higher physiologies across the board. Um, this was the only significant uh, component of the PCA temperature and reef zone were other things I explored, but they did not have a significant effect on the physiology. Similarly, for parietes, we only saw a significant effect of PCO2 on the holobiont physiology. Again, higher physiologies were tended towards those in lower PCO2 two treatments. And then I went ahead and displayed the pseudodeplorystrigosa by temperature. Uh, PCO2 was also a significant predictor, but the most significant thing for predicting the physiology of the pseudodeploria was temperature. And so you can hear or see here the clustering of the hot in red um, is much closer than the, the 28 in blue. So we've got um, this is showing evidence that even though in, we're not seeing a strong effect of PCO2 across the board. And generally people are mostly concerned about warming impacting corals. We can see that there might be this chronic stressor of acidification just across the board impacting the holobiont physiology of these corals. So the last thing I did with these ones was look at that gene expression. Um, while I have the samples for all of them, we decided to focus in on Sideraster Sideria. Um, again, this is the coral that our lab does the most work with. So we were really interested to see the gene expression. So the first thing I wanted to do looking at the gene expression of these species was to just kind of get a sense of the overall gene expression profiles. So here I have the, I believe it's 43 different samples across treatments. And I wanted to see what kind of uh, clustering we would find in this global gene expression. So the first thing I looked at was temperature. Uh, temperature wasn't having a significant effect on the clustering. So if you look at the outside color of each point, that represents if it's blue. So like here, we've got a blue circle. That's going to be 28 degrees. Same thing with this blue triangle. Um, the outside circle is red. It would be 31 degrees. So you can see there's a pretty big spread in temperature effects on gene expression. So then I looked at PCO2 thinking that might be more of a significant predictor for this species based on the physiology. And while it is more significant, again, this is looking at that inside color. I know this is really complicated, but I wanted to get a bunch of information in it. Um, again, light purple uh, is low PCO2 up to the dark orange, which is high PCO2. You can again see it doesn't really cluster clearly by PCO2 treatment. And so I've tested a bunch of other things like colony effects and reef zone effects, and they were starting to get a little bit closer. But then one thing we realized, maybe they're hosting different symbiont species. And so this was something we looked into. Um, we found this paper by Bauman et al. in 2018 that happened to have coral samples of this species from similar areas of our two sites. So this Punta Gorda site is essentially the transect down here. Their low thermal variability is this, um, oh, that's backwards. This, this one is the Sapodilla Keys and the high, high um, variability is the inside the Port Honduras Marine Reserve. Sorry that they're flipped. And if you can see the one that is inch offshore, it has a combination of different symbiont species. Whereas the one that's inshore, I, I know it's backwards, um, only host a single symbiont species. So was this something we also saw? Answer is yes. Um, so this one's a little bit simpler. Uh, the blue bars are the cladocopium species. And the orange bars are, or the orange is Durastinium. 
And there's some other background noise in there that I haven't teased out more. But if you see the um, inshore colonies we have down here, both of them, all fragments from each colony only host Cladocopia, whereas we see our offshore colonies are hosting uh, different species of symbionts based on our tag seed data. So this is just percent uh, based on the reads. Uh, so this is something we're exploring a little bit further. But when we looked at our PCA again for global gene expression, um, this was our best predictor for our host. I didn't, I forgot to specify this. Uh, this is our gene expression of just our coral host. And the best predictor of our symbiont uh, or our, our host clustering in our PCA was symbiont species. So this is suggesting that maybe our symbiont species are playing a pretty large role in Sideraestria sideria's gene expression um, across the board. So again, this is something I'm exploring more. Um, keep playing with this uh, every week to see if I can break this sort of trend because uh, maybe it could be due to contamination. So again, trying to break it. I'm happy to chat if people have suggestions on if this looks completely wrong, um, but we're excited by this. So then I went ahead and also threw this in with my physiology of the holobiont. And so this percent one is percent cladocopium. So corals that hosted more cladocopium symbionts are gonna be this direction. And the thing that I found, again, interesting was we were seeing clustering by those symbiont species in the physiologies. And then also um, <laughs> corals that tended to host more durastinium had higher lipid content. Um, again, this is something that I'm exploring more, um, but it could be interesting to see that symbiont species are dictating the host physiology uh, to this extent. So um, I like to try and peg some winners and losers with these corals. Um, winners are gonna have higher physiology across the board. They're gonna be more likely to uh, withstand uh, environmental stressors like acidification and warming. Whereas our losers are gonna be the ones that we're seeing bleaching um, more susceptible to um, even diseases. They might have lower reproductive output. So based on my four species, and this experiment, I'm pegging Sideraestria sideria and Paredes astroides as winners on Caribbean reefs and Andaria tenufolia and Pseudodiploria strigosa as losers on Caribbean reefs. So I told you I was gonna make you come back to this reef. So say this was um, the reef of today. And if my data were to accu accurately project what would happen to these four species in the future, this is what I would think would happen. Overall, we're gonna see lower abundance of corals because even though I didn't show the survival data, we were having um, higher mortality with warming and high PCO2 across the board. Um, but we're also gonna see that tenufolia and uh, pseudodiploria are gonna start disappearing on reefs because these ones are more thermally sensitive and therefore these bleaching events are more likely to knock them off the reefs. And then we're gonna see that across the board, corals are getting smaller, but we're gonna still see these dominant corals of Sideraestria and Parides. And I was excited to see that this is something not completely far-fetched. Um, this is coral cover for the Florida Keys, and it's showing that relative abundance on Caribbean coral reefs is favoring uh, Sideraestria and Parides, whereas Tenufolia and Pseudodiploria have that lower abundance on coral reefs. So maybe this is something that um, is just gonna be magnified through time. Um, so then just gonna wrap up quickly with uh, why does this all matter? Um, <laughs> so I personally am really interested in coral calcification, but I can understand why people may not um, understand why that's important or care about it. But calcification and linear extension, um, these skeletal components of the coral are what makes the the reef framework. Without these corals, um, specifically here are some acroporas within the Caribbean, uh, we don't have habitat for fish. And if we're not having habitat for fish, we're losing a lot of the other species. Um, and people don't want to go snorkel on a flat reef. 
Uh, so these components are really important for the actual production and um, interest in coral reefs. And so similarly, the physiology is really important because if we have a coral that has really low energy content, it's unlikely that those corals are gonna be able to grow. So uh, storms will likely come through and knock these corals because they're big and branchy um, down, but they're usually able to start growing rapidly again. But if they don't have high energy content, maybe they aren't able to grow, or maybe they have to allocate their energy to reproductive output instead. And so these are so intertwined and I think it's easy for us to get a tunnel vision on a single response of species. And then again, just bringing it a little bit further out, like I love corals. I think they're one of the coolest things in the world, but they have bigger implications. So coral reefs harbor immense diversity. Um, I love this image because it's a single coral colony, but living in it and on it and uh, all around it, you have tons of diversity. And then also coral reefs are really important for fishing, whether that is for sustaining your own family, for providing an income for your family, or just for fun. Um, coral reefs are really important for these fish or for fishing. They also can act as a natural buffer against storms. This is again important for that making the physical structure of the reef. Uh, without those corals to produce the structure of the reef we're losing that coastal protection for these um, island and coastal communities. And then finally, tourism. Everybody loves to go to the Caribbean or wherever your favorite coral reef is to just have a good time, sit on some sandy beaches, check out the wildlife. And without coral reefs to attract people there, um, we're going to have this effect on the communities that re heavily rely on the income from the tourist industry. And so it's just this vicious cycle of, we need to keep an eye out for these coral reefs because we wanna keep these other things going, but also tourism can be dangerous for the coral reefs. So um, I really appreciate your time. And I just wanna give a big shout out to all of my lab members in the different labs that I've been jumping through, including the Castillo lab at UNC and the Bruno lab at UNC, as well as my current lab at BU in the Davies lab. And I would be happy to take any questions you had. Okay, thanks so much, Colleen. That was a really beautiful and uh, such a well conveyed story. I really liked that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as people are thinking of their questions, please, either go ahead and type them in the chat, or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question in person, um, feel free to do that. I have a question. Um, Colleen, it's Hannah, great talk. Um, I think those are some of the best climate change cartoons that I've ever seen in a talk. I really enjoyed that. And so I think your um, symbiont gene expression results are really neat. And I think um, also like um, neat, but also I think like the literature supports them in that. Um, Cladocopium and Durastinium would have different like physiology and gene expression responses. I was, I might have missed this, um, but were you determining like percent Cladocopium or Durastinium by which transcriptome they were mapping to or by ITS? And I was wondering um, if it was something where like you were blasting and if it was just like one maximum target sequence or if you blasted, if you like um, elicited multiple and if like if, say your max um, target seeks were five, was it just like all cladocopium for all the cladocopiums and all durastinium or a bit of a mix? Um, yeah. yeah, so it was not ITS2, which is one of the things that um, Sarah and I have talked a little bit about maybe trying to get the ITS2 because um, we, and we were initially worried that we shouldn't be seeing the durastinium in the Sidorastria samples. Um, but then we found that other work that those are basically our same sites because the Bauman paper is also from my lab at UNC. So we know that the sites are essentially the same. So the corals um, exhibiting those differences in communities actually made sense. Um, and yeah, so we were using the tag seek mapping. Um, and then 
What was your next? Sorry, what was your other question? Or, no, I think that did. Oh, um, we can also chat more about it later, but I think that is wise to stray away from the ITS2 given all of the intragenomic variants and trouble like that could get you into. But I was wondering about like if you were having like more than one, like when blasting the debate databases, like you can have like more than one target sequence for the output. And like if you would, if it was uniform in between, like which assembly it would map to. I don't actually remember, um, but that is a good thing for me to look into and we should chat more about that. Yeah, yeah, I can show you my scripts. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be super helpful. Thank you. Cool, great job. Can I say something off of that as well? Yeah. Hi, Colleen, it's Holly, great, great talk, uh, really comprehensive. Um, in that respect, we have data that's ITS2 and um, relative abundance from ITS2 and relative abundance from RNA-seq, and they do not match for C and D, but that's in uh, Montepera Capitata. So I would be interested to talk, talk to you about that too in our meeting um, about how you quantified that with the with the tag-seq. But I think we're still in this place where, I, I, I mean, I'm not saying ITS2 is the best way to do it either. And so I do like the qPCR approach um at the clade level but that's a clade level and so it really depends on if you have the the primers designed for it already um mm -hmm. but i had one other question yeah. um that was just the comment sorry i'm the comment person now um so in your in your sem how do you tell the difference between dissolution and mal or and malformation or the, the lack of secondary calcitation and infilling so what makes you think that it's dissolution um so the Main reason I'm thinking it's dissolution is because um, I'm only seeing that flaking away almost in that really high PCO2. And I didn't show it here, but we were able to calculate out our gross calcification rates. And we see that gross calcification rates, like we we're having pretty sufficient calcification, but we were seeing a net, like a a loss of the skeleton. Um, and some of the work I had done as an undergrad actually measured really low pH within the tissue of the coral. So um, even under normal conditions, the pH was getting within the tissue or like the gastrovascular cavity was getting down to about um, seven, um, sometimes in 6.9 area. And so I'm thinking that we're seeing in these dark periods um, the issues of dissolution of the skeleton. And so that's my reasoning. Um, I've shown it to committee members as well. And they, their best guess was the dissolution. Our, our big concern was it got like nicked in the process of being um, like shipped and everything. But I compared it to samples that I know got chipped and they have a very different um, appearance. Can you look at your TA data? Is it a flow through system or could you look at your TA data to see if there's any TA enrichment signal from, from the lowest tanks? The, I don't think they're enriched. I do have um, weekly water samples where we measured total alkalinity. So I can look, in, look into that. That's a good, good idea. Yeah, I guess it depends on if it's flow through and how fast it goes through, but that could be interesting. Well, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you more. Maybe I'll let other people talk. Thanks. Yeah. So we have a question in the chat from Trisha. She says, impressive work synthesizing a lot of data. Why is Belize a hotspot for studying corals? And given your meta analysis results, are there other regions with relevant coral populations that should be studied in the Caribbean? Great question. Um, we're biased about the Belize in my lab. My advisor actually is from Belize. So that's one of the reasons it's a hot topic in our lab. Uh, but on top of that, as far as the region goes, uh, the Belize Barrier Reef is the second largest barrier reef behind the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. So it has that benefit. But then also, um, I've been a lot of different places across the Caribbean and the some of the healthiest coral cover I have seen is in Belize. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of I different ideas as to why, and they do typically have slightly cooler thermal histories than they're they're exp experiencing cooler thermal history than other places throughout the Caribbean. 
um, the country itself is actually doing a whole lot or has been doing a whole lot to protect their reefs. And so I think that has had an impact. Um, and so that's one of the reasons it's really popular um, and just accessibility. Um, the people are wonderful to work with there. And then other like target locations, I think it depends on what you're interested in. Um, so if you're interested in the disease studies, like Florida Keys is the hot spot right now because the disease is, um, the tissue loss disease is just um, flying through that. So that would be probably a target if you're looking at um, some weird corals that are surviving really turbid, um, dark conditions, go to the Columbia. There's some weird reefs there. So I, my heart goes out to the Caribbean because a lot of people have written them off, written these reefs off already. Um, but it, I think that the corals that are there are these resilient ones for the most part, they're not all going to be resilient, but they've gone through a lot of stress in the past few decades. So I think the ones we see are pretty, pretty awesome. I had a question for you, Colleen. The, so in your experimental setup, you had uh, quite a few, quite a long time of like acclimation and getting used to new conditions. Do you have a sense of how results would change like if a warm current of water came through or like what, what would be different if it was like a quick change in temperature or in pH? Yeah, so interesting, um, we had a, Sarah Davies was a postdoc um, at UNC when I was doing this. So she had like a piggyback study on this one where that 30 days that I gave the corals at treatment, but I wasn't considering it part of the experiment. She started her experiment there. And that actually is currently in review at LNO. And so she has more of that immediate response to changing uh, to the treatment conditions. And so her interest was a little bit more um, through time, whereas mine was this bulk change. And she did use different colonies entirely. So it's not di directly comparable to these corals but she used the same species. And we did see that um, the corals through time, if they were going to have a response, like a negative response to the treatments, that through time, those responses became more apparent, uh, especially with warming in Pseudodiploria, um, the brain coral. So that is a, something that I think we, we had a student who tried to test a like a pulse event, like a long term experiment, but put a pulse event in some of the systems and it didn't quite work out. But yeah, so that would be a little bit more relevant to the actual system, whereas ours were kept at a constant temperature. We did have diurnal PCO2, but constant temperature. All right, if nobody has any other questions for Colleen, um, postdocs and grad students stay on the call and everyone else will see you at the next bio at noon. Thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. <laughs>